What's up? It's Matt. I'm live from Oakley Hall, the food kitchen in Cincinnati, Ohio. Not in the studio, but I've got a great guest for you today. I've got Taylor Scott. We'll be back in a second to dig into his book. Taylor, I've got some some bookmarks in the book to talk to you about. But before we do that, tell us who Taylor Scott is and tell us about leading with hospitality. Great. Well, awesome to see you got the book. Love to see that you have bookmarks. You know, one of the for authors, there, there's few things we like more than when people not only get our book but actually read it. So I appreciate yeah. that. Well, but yeah, I'm from Grayson, Kentucky originally. I understand that you're also uh, from Kentucky, so we, yeah, we yeah. both probably agree. We are we Wildcats fans. I'm a Tar Heel yeah. fan, unfortunately. Tar Heel fan. Well, we're all praying for you then, the UNC fans. But but no, I'm from Grayson, <laughs> Kentucky originally, and then. Uh, ended up going to undergrad down in Florida, about 40 miles west of Walt Disney World. And that's where I got into the, the whole hospitality uh, scene. And so I spent several years, both during college and after working for uh, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts there in Orlando, ended up leaving and doing some uh, graduate work focused in hospitality and then landed where I am now here in Las Vegas. And I worked for a couple places here in Las Vegas when an encore, as well as the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas. Then I went back to Disney, but over at Disneyland. I led the sales team at Disney Vacation Club for a few years. Um, and then I did a career transition, a career switch, and, and got into writing books and creating leadership development workshops. And so now I'm an author, a speaker, and a leadership development consultant. And I work with teams and leaders all over the country um, a lot of my clients are in hospitality. Some are outside of hospitality, but I teach and coach leadership development. Awesome. Well, I can. I was telling somebody a story yesterday about uh, Disneyland down in Florida because I was there a few times. I've had a 17 and 19 year old now, but when they were little kids, we were there a lot. And I was telling them a story about it because they had never been there. I said, the thing that freaked me out the most that I didn't know about Disney until after I went there was every time I stopped to do something, it was like somebody was like had pixeled me, like they were right behind me. I'm like, are you looking for the restroom, sir? I'm like, I actually am. And then I could try to let me walk you to it. And I'm like, where the hell did that person come from? Like, there was nobody there. And then I later heard the stories about some of the fake trees and the places employees hide. But the one thing that marveled me was, you know, one, I was I was surprised at how uh, affordable a lot of the stuff was in Disney. The fact that they weren't gouging you like most of the parks and athletic facilities do, but also the fact that hospitality was like all that I noticed there. Uh, and it was it was crazy because everywhere I turned around, there was somebody there to help. My dad growing up in the retail business, my dad's number one pet peeve was people that point. You walk into a store, hey, where are where are the green shoes at? Oh, they're back in aisle 74. And you're like, what the hell's aisle 74? And my dad's rule was you don't point, you, t you grab them, you walk them to it. And as you're going there, you build rapport to find out why they're looking for that because there's opportunity for possibly upsell, but also make sure they find the right product so that they're a happier customer. 100%. I think your dad might've gone through some of the same Disney training I went through then. Maybe he did some of those I same am, internships. Uh, yeah. So uh, Las Vegas now, Kentucky born. Yeah, like I'm, I'm the unfortunate not Kentucky fan. My mom's from North Carolina. My dad's from Chicago. Okay. So in the 80s, growing up in the 80s, it was Michael Jordan. Uh, but I'm really not even a, a much of a sports fan anymore. I've kind of graduated from sports. My kids' sports now, high school and college sports, and 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 running the company. But what was the motivation behind the book? So you know, be human, emotionally connect, serve selflessly. Uh, selflessly. What what was the motivation behind writing this uh, when you did? Yeah, I had uh, I had written my first book called Ball Games to Boardrooms. So I'm, okay. I grew up old school basketball guy from Kentucky, and and I knew I wanted to write a book but had no clue how to do it. So for that first book out of the gate, I chose a topic, you know, I was passionate about new and, and, and knew quite a bit about which are these, these leadership lessons, you know, we can take from sports and apply them to our roles, you know, in, in corporate America and, and my target market, if you will, these up and comers. So the millennials and now Gen Z's who have joined us in the workforce. But uh, so that book came out in 2017 and then short, it's kind of like running a marathon. Uh, my wife and I, we just did the Walt Disney World half marathon uh, nice, on November nice. 7th. And like, it's kind of like when you talk to somebody that, that runs endurance races, when you cross the finish line and everything kind of dies down, the first thing you start thinking about is, can I do another one? Can I, can I do another? So that was me writing a book. And so I thought, 
can I do another one? But this time I wanted it to be bigger and I wanted to learn how to, you know, basically get into this business, this space that I'm in now. So, so what did I choose? Well, I chose this topic, uh, leading with hospitality. And so along the way, you know, working for these different places, these great you know, game changing brands and, and, and being able to be blessed to work at some of the, some, some of these great places, especially here in Las Vegas and then the Disney's of the world. I always wonder, you know, why is it we, we, we love our favorite leaders. You know, why is that? And so the more and more I researched, it turns out that human behavior is human behavior. And what I found is it's, it's a lot of the same reasons that you and I, like we can talk about the Disney's of the world. And, and, and you know, I like the Kentucky Wildcats. I'm emotionally connected to Kentucky and Kentucky basketball. I'm emotionally connected to Disney from not only vacationing there throughout my childhood, but also interning there in college. Like, that's my Christmas tree right there. And there's Mickey ears on top instead of an angel there. Uh, but, but so what I found is that we love our favorite leaders for the same reasons we love our favorite hospitality destinations. And, and so the more I kept reading, the more I kept researching, this started out as a passion project. And then when the yeah. pandemic hit, I actually lost my job. I was working for a consultancy based here in Las Vegas. And I'd go out and teach and coach and do workshops. I would create workshops and I'd go out and consult with my clients out on the road, you know, our clients. Pandemic hits and all that went to the wayside. So this was a passion project that I'd been working on. And I had I had eight or nine chapters kind of already crafted out. And so anyway, I brushed it off and sent it off to a few people, kind of a God thing, really, and just kind of took some risks and Lo and behold, this thing turned into a real life book and a big grown up book with a real publisher, Ben Bella Books. And so what I do is I have four, you know, four parts to the book, connect, serve, engage, and inspire. And then there's, there's literal action plans and stories, you know, principles, illustrations, and then applications for how leaders out there can start applying these things you know, in their daily walk as leaders, whether you're leading a restaurant, hotel, uh, or even outside the hospitality industry. Yeah. And I, know, and I know the one thing you made a comment of in some of their communication was you're not a restaurant expert. And I think <laughs> that's kind of the whole thing here is restaurant experts. And honestly, you probably are not realize because hospitality, I mean, I think we, the pandemic and the restaurant business showed a lot of restaurants, the ones that we know that struggled more than others was because they didn't have, they forgot their roots. The roots of eating out is hospitality. You know, the, the going to Las Vegas, I mean, you're in the Mecca of hospitality outside of probably Orlando where it's all about that. But I want to dig into a couple of the things I pulled up. So page 95, you talk about relationships. So talk about relationships with regards to whether it's, you know, vendors, whether it's employees, whether it's customers, when it comes to a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, a lot of what I write about and speak about today is because I spent 20 years doing it. You know, I spent 20 years working my way around working, you know, leading different lines of business, you know, whether it be. Uh, you know, bell services or housekeeping or front desk. And even, you know, after I transitioned to being a consultant, I spent, you may have been there, I spent about six weeks on property at the Brown Hotel in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, I've been there. Uh, historic hotel. That's where, for restaurant people, that's where the Kentucky Hot Brown was born. You know, yep. the dish with the turkey and the bread and the gravy and all the goodness on there. Well, it was born right at Jay Graham's Cafe right there in the back, in the back kitchen of the, the Brown Hotel. But but one of the things that kept coming up for me, and, and you know, as back then, you know, and up and comers, I was, you know, learning how to be a leader and how to become a great leader, was the leaders that I had that would only focus on results. They would only focus on the bottom line, the numbers, the results. Those are the ones that it, it, that can only last for so long. That that's not sustainable, and so because we're all human beings. So when I'm out there, it's 90 degrees, and I'm running the front drive as a bell service manager in Orlando and there's convention after convention after convention coming in at Gaylord Palms resort, for example. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're always focusing on the numbers and the results, there's only so long that this leader is going to be passionate and still hospitable out there with your guests, not, 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 not to mention your teams. So I always loved the leaders and I always loved the people that talk about not only the results, but also relationships. There's a way we can do this to focus on, relationships and results. And as you know, and I know probably many people watching here, and especially right now, coming up out of this pandemic, is, is when we focus on the relationships first, whether it's with our teams, 
or with a client or with our guests or with our customers or with our vendors? When we focus on relationships first, building trust along the way, can we find some commonality? Uh, can we find what we both share as emotional connections, you know, each other? It's amazing what then happens with results organically. So that's really the thought and the foundation of where this first came from. And then um, I go into way more detail on some, some specific tactics that leaders can do to, to make relationships, you know, make relationships magical again kind of thing in your daily leadership approach. Yeah, and it's, it's an important topic because I've learned, I became a manager in our business back in the 90s and uh, early 2000s as a young adult, like in my 20s. And we had grew a boat dealership and I was working radio and running a boat dealership in my family and grew it to 40 plus employees. And here I am in my late 20s and I was a numbers guy. I was 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Sunday. Let's grind, grind, grind. And I later learned that, you know, a lot of people's motivations differ. Uh, and that was one thing that was important. I found out was that it, it's not always money. It might be freedom. It might be different, you know, different connections in their life. It might be their, their lake house. It might be vacations with their kids. But if you don't develop the relationships with your team to understand what motivates them, like you said, the, the money, the motivation of money and, and the numbers and, and going by that only lasts so long. And that's what you see a lot of times I see when a lot of companies get gobbled up in private equity or go public is that all of that stuff's out the window. It's who's the, the best manager a lot of times is the person that's the numbers guy versus the person that's actually getting results long term because those are short term wins. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this this model and, you know, this idea, you know, for the same reasons that the Disney's have become the Disney's uh, yeah. that, you know, places like the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas here in Vegas win an encore Las Vegas and some whatever your favorite you know restaurants are for us, you know, back home, Jeff Ruby's, you know, they've been able to sustain and grow over the years. Well, they do this stuff, right? They they, they make it about people uh, because to your point. That's what drew us all to the hospitality business in the first place. We like being around people. We like serving other people uh, and being in community with people. Yep. And, and I, I missed the, I missed that burger and milkshake joint at Cosmopolitan. I haven't been there in a couple. We were there back in the spring when I was there with my wife and son. Yeah, my parents are actually on their way out. They're actually they're actually near you right now. They're 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 gonna fly out of uh, Cincinnati yeah. Airport tomorrow morning early. I pick them up tomorrow from the airport. I can't wait tomorrow morning. And then we're all going down to the strip for a couple of days. And my wife and I were going to stay at the Cosmopolitan. Nice. Nice. So I'm looking forward to getting back down there and enjoying some stuff as a guest. I stayed there once and I had the unfortunate that my room was like the top of that jumbotron. I guess there's an ice skating rink or something there. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And my room was right there. And I happened to just be beat from a bunch of different West and East Coast swings. And I went to bed at like 10 o'clock and it was toy story playing really loud and you could just hear everything and i was like well i figure this would be cool if i was here with my kids i'm yeah. here for business and i have no right. interest in, in in being out yeah the, the the blessing and the curse of all the magic right. of las vegas there so uh chapter nine talks with grace and it's something i've learned the hard way because you know sometimes i've led my team and grace is not my uh, middle name and it, it's humbling when you look back on how you handled situations yeah for sure and you know one of the things that inspired this for me i, I grew up you know, like i said I, I grew up in kentucky there you know playing basketball and you know for us growing up i mean you, you study hard my mom was my kindergarten teacher like both of my grandmothers were teachers so for me it was you know you had to do well in school and I was diehard basketball guy. So, you know, coaches were very important to me. And then it was like going to church on Sundays and, you know, going to going to church on Wednesday nights kind of thing. And so, you know, another that's another thing is like what you find, you, you get out and about. And, you know, we've been out of school now, what, you know, 25, 30 years doing what we've been doing. And, and when you run into people, when you run into other leaders, when you run into other successful people like yourself who've been doing this, they end up saying exactly what you just said is that at the end of the day, really, we're all human beings. So I make the analogy in the book. I said, you know, you can be a superhuman leader or you can be a human leader. You know, superhuman leader, by that I mean, pretend you've got it all figured out. Pretend that you've never made a mistake ever in your life. Well, if you do that, you can do that. But you'll, you'll really connect with and relate to about zero out of 10 people. But if you're a human leader, if you're a human being, and you go ahead and admit to people, you know what? I kind of messed up on that. 
you know, I made, I made, a t- I, made a, I made the wrong decision. Yep. And if you're humble about it, and I say three things, you know, first, extend grace to other people. Second is ask for grace from other people, whether it be from a, a fellow team, a fellow partner, a teammate, or even a guest. And then be graceful. Be graceful with your words. It's amazing what that'll do when we're graceful with our words, what that does to create the environment around us. Yeah, I want to find a uh, video. I want to show you this. I can't really watch it, but we have a, uh, an app we use called Workplace where we communicate with our team. And last week, I had gotten pretty crappy with one of our team members. I wouldn't say I, I was critical of his performance on something. And I was actually wrong. Number one, I was wrong on what he was doing. Number two, I approached it the wrong way. And so I popped, I called him first and said, you know what? I screwed up. I apologize. I was a jackass. Uh, it's not how I should have led you. I saw how I should have treated you. And especially how I did it in a public manner in our employee forum. The next thing I did was went on there and went live in the group and said, hey, it's me, the jackass, the one that talked to, that talked to Luis this way and approached it wrong. And that was one thing for me. It was like some it's what I've, I'm not afraid to do as an adult. When I was 25, I was superhuman, like you mentioned. I was right. I was this, this, and this. Now I'm like, you know what? I realize that every day I'm going to do something incorrect that I need to learn to swallow pride and, and accept it and be graceful in that defeat and support my team. And how, does that, how do you think that made your team feel in that moment? Like what kind of oh, feedback did you get from that? Oh, they, they, they all loved it. Uh, because they saw that it, a lot of them had never been in that situation. I mean, we've all been in a situation where we've had the opposite, where you've been in a meeting or you've been in a place and you have a, a boss or a manager that just destroys you or says something and they're wrong. Even if they're not wrong, you feel like, oh man, I've been working my ass off and this sure. happened. And then, and then I think that's where you, you I kind of look at that myself, look back at my past experiences and say, what, what's been the thing that's really defeated my ego, my motivation? Let's do the opposite. And that's I was, right. in this case, I was, I, even if I wasn't wrong in this case, which I was, I still would have had the same type of message like, hey, I shouldn't have done this. I apologize. Uh, but I think you've got to do that because like you said, it shows human. Like right now, there's a man filming me that films me <laughs> all the time. And one of the reasons he films me all the time is that I found that a lot of my content we put out marketing-wise of my company, my brand, is to rehearse sometimes. It's not normal. And I forget he's even there sometimes. I just remembered when I looked over and there he was. I'm like, there's Max. But I wanted to have him filming things I'm talking about so that people see my actual personality and that they realize that, you know, like you said, that there's grace out there. 100%. Yeah, and that, that, that's what I'm trying to do. It, it, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go out and say, you know, two, two, two audiences. A, if you're an up and comer, right? If you're if you're like that that per person that, that just maybe got into their first leadership role, or maybe you're you're in the middle management sort of arena, uh, and or if you're a senior leader like yourself, and you have these leaders that you're grooming, and you have this this opportunity to shape the culture, your leadership culture of your organization. That's what I'm trying to do. Is I'm trying to say, I just did the next 15 years, the next 12 years, you up and comer that you are getting ready to do. Here's some stuff that works. Here's some stuff I found that really doesn't work. I want to save you from having these frustrations, you know, that, that many of us had coming up through the ranks. And that's a, that's a great thing. I, I heard Damon John say one time at a speech that he'll pay anybody any amount of money that's above him to get their shortcuts. It's not necessarily a shortcut because he's going to eventually get there, but it's kind of those bumps that you might hit. And a book like this has those. And the last piece I'll lead you with is uh, page 198, Meaningful Work. So like our business, a lot of my employees are former hospitality workers. They're marketing people. And we're literally, uh, we know we're on a path to help small businesses, restaurants, independent owners, and make a hero out of that operator and help them survive and thrive. Uh, And there's meaning behind that. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, I've had a culture in our business where we have a vivid vision. If you've seen the book by Cam Harold, where we have a, eight page document that everybody's required to read that talks about why we're doing what we're doing and the path we're on, but talk about the importance of, of meaningful work and tasks and a a path that people need to be on. Yeah. And it's never been more important than right now. And that's, that's, what's kind of neat about this is I started writing this book in like the summer of 2018, like well before any of us became 
experts in respiratory viruses and all the things we've all had to navigate the last couple of years. And so, but here's what we now have learned. We see all the stuff coming out, the big resi- you know, the, the great resignation, the big quit, the turnover tsunami that probably a lot of your clients, I know several of my clients are dealing with right now. My wife works in hospitality here in Las Vegas and her, her company's dealing with it. Furlough people, bring them back. Now we need people, we can't get enough people. Here's what we know and here's what's neat about you know this book coming out and this message coming out at the same time now that a lot of people are having to deal with putting back together, building back after this pandemic. What we find and what researchers and experts are telling us is that after recessions, after wars, and as it turns out, after pandemics, people, human beings, workers, and, and our guests, customers, and clients alike, we all sit back and we reevaluate. And we reevaluate yeah. what kind of career do I really want? What kind of life do I really want to have? And the word that a lot of people are using right now is a lot of millennials, a lot of Gen Zs, they're searching for meaning now more than ever. And yeah. so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, hey, leaders, hey, we have an opportunity to transform what might on the surface seem like a menial job. We can transform that into meaningful work. And I just say, yeah. if, we do, if, if we do these types of things, just like we all kind of grew up doing, working in hospitality, connecting with our customers, connecting with our guests on a human, personal level, before we start, you know, trying to show them the specials or sell them on the, you know, you know up, upgrading them into the, the, the eight ounce filet versus the whatever. And then, and then really serving people before or for no other reason other than just to serve them and thinking about it from their perspective instead of ours. You know, really taking the time to listen with empathy, what might be going on in their life, what might be going on in their situation. And then when we do that, when they know that we are at least trying to understand how they feel and what might help them um, overcome some obstacles that they might be having, just like those of us that grew up in hospitality. I had to do it as a front desk manager. I had to do it as a bell services manager. I had to do it on the front lines, working the front desk and working in the theme parks down there. Uh, And I'm saying, let's do that stuff as leaders and let's engage with people uh, and and really do things like make sure that they feel like they're noticed and known. I don't know about you, but I've found that everybody, everybody wants to be noticed and known for something. And so there's very few, you know, people in life that will make us feel better than when they, when we know that they actually know how good we are. When they, when we know, well, like for, if I'm working for you, if I know that you actually see me and you recognize my contributions and the value that I'm bringing, that changes the entire game. Now, all of a sudden, I can't wait to get up at five in the morning and shave and shower and work out and go report to work and do what I do for you and for the cause that you've invited me to be on. You know, and the last piece is is inspiration. You know, it's serve, it's it's connect, serve, engage, and then inspire. And I just draw on all the stuff I did learn from Disney. You know, they're they're, all the things that they are. You know, the very foundation, and and Bob Iger in his tenure as CEO helped us all understand this, that um, Disney is a storytelling company. Everything that they put out, whether it's a theme park, a movie, a, 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 an acquisition of Lucasfilms, an acquisition of Marvel, the IP that continues to come out, the new fireworks show at Epcot, Epcot called Harmonious, it tells a story. Well, now we can all look back and we can, and this is what I'm trying to say to leaders all over, whether you work in hospitality or not, whether you work in restaurants or not, if you lead other human beings, you can connect with people emotionally when you share stories that will help you find ways that you can bond with people on a whole new level. And then that, all of that stuff together, not one or two of those things in a vacuum, it's not one silver bullet. Unfortunately, it's a bunch of little things that when we do that, and it can really be summed up in being human, emotionally connecting with other people and serving them selflessly. I believe, and I I just know it and I believe it because I've lived it. And I think many of us have too. If you think back to the best leader you ever had, if you think back to the best season of your life or career, 
where things were clicking. Chances are you had elements of all those things and it was not just a job. It really felt like meaningful work. And that's what people want right now. And I believe while it's a tough and challenging season for people that are running their own business, people that are leading, you know, huge corporations, particularly in hospitality to try to get people to come back to work, we have, a, we have an opportunity to quadruple down on leading with hospitality. It's the same stuff we all learned when we were doing hospitality. Now, we just got to lead with hospitality. I love it. Inspiring words. So get on Amazon, people. There's the book, Lead with Hospitality. Get on Amazon. Number one, buy the book. Number two, read it. Number three, leave a review about how awesome the book is because that helps authors like this man. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being with us. Where can the people find more information about you and your business? Yeah, thanks a lot. You can go to leadwithhospitality.com. Leadwithhospitality.com, simple as that. All my stuff's on there. You can go to tscott1502, tscott1502 on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm Taylor Scott on LinkedIn and Facebook. And also, if you're an audio person, and you might be because you're watching this or listening to a podcast, if you are more of an audiobook type person, Lead with Hospitality is available on audiobook, and I narrate it. So if you like this 26 minutes, there's six hours and eight minutes of me talking about all of the magic of Lead with Hospitality in the audiobook. Yeah, I joke with yeah. my wife when I was getting ready to record my last book. But I haven't done it yet. I started it. We got a new studio we just put in that I'm going to actually get it done. But I told her about me doing the audiobook. She's like, yeah, I won't be listening to you on audiobook for six hours. So don't even right. say anything. I got a similar response from my own wife as well. Well, cool. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on. Have a great weekend in sunny Las Vegas. And tell your, your parents from Kentucky, another Kentucky, and said hi. Appreciate that. Happy holidays. Thanks for having me. Look forward to keeping in touch. It does.